still. Probably aren't doing them as well. But I'm 61 and um, trying. We have a visitor on the set, but he's gone now. We started electric vehicle television in uh, May of 2009. It's been about seven and a half years. Recently, we've been pretty busy um, and with fewer people, but um, we're having a lot of fun. And I'm still doing the show. It's just not every Friday like it was for a long time, but we're still doing it. This um, show, we have uh, Tesla reporting their profits, which was kind of interesting. They um, reported over 25,000 cars um, sold and delivered for the quarter. Um, a two, $21 million profit. Um, and so they've technically had a profitable quarter now, which they wanted to do before the capital expenditures of getting the uh, um, Model 3 um, production line in place, and they did do it. But in doing that, that included $135 million in ZEV credits. These are California Zero Emission Vehicle, or ZEV, credits that people who sell cars in California have to buy if they don't sell enough zero emission vehicles to cover the sales of their gasoline vehicles, they can buy credits from zero emission vehicle producers like Tesla. And so their figures included $135 million in ZIF credits that have kind of been moved around and done in this quarter um, to where, for example, the next quarter they don't expect to realize any income from that at all. So they are playing the usual Hillary Clinton-style games with uh, reality, but technically did have a profitable quarter and I believe uh, have established themselves at this point. They're the top-selling luxury sedan in the United States, uh, beating out BMW and Mercedes-Benz, Jaguar, uh, Mercedes, uh, I said Mercedes, Volkswagen at all, um, Cadillac, uh, Lexus, um, and so forth. So uh, I think that um, we've come a long way from when everyone was talking about whether Tesla would survive. Clearly, they will survive. They're building cars, uh, in theory, uh, making money occasionally with actually pretty high margins. Uh, looks like 28, 29% on the cars themselves. And so um, the days of wondering if Tesla could make it and become a US automaker, they are a US automaker and they are making and selling cars and their future is actually quite secure. In fact, some say that they're up to about 700,000 reservations for the $35,000 Gen 3. This week, they had a very interesting announcement, and I believe it was the new product that uh, Elon was referring to uh, that he didn't announce on October 16th or whatever the date was, but he did eventually come out with it. And it has to do with their acquisition of his cousin's company, Solar City, And, of course, Tesla has their Gigafactory um, making batteries. And um, one of the um, things that they had announced was a power wall. And this was uh, about a three and a half kilowatt device um, to uh, store energy in batteries, uh, which, of course, they make. And, but also to act as an inverter and a solar charge controller all in one device 
that would let you charge your batteries uh, by solar or by AC, and in the event of a power outage, um, produce AC, uh, and sort of vaguely referring to the fact that in some places in California there's such a differential between daytime electricity and nighttime electricity that you could use this to produce your electricity during the day and then replenish it at night with the lower rate electricity. Doesn't really work out very well economically for most of us. In any event, they had taken a number of reservations and then had a number of people um, not execute on that. And so the home power wall is um, sort of been uh, revised. And now it is a device that stores 14 kilowatt hours of um, energy. Now that's about enough to run one of our electric cars um, for the 50 or 60 miles we typically build them now. Um, and uh, so it's a significant, it's over twice the storage. They've also doubled the output where it will act as an inverter at um, 7,500 watts or 7.5 kilowatts. And I believe that will peak, uh, you know, for startup or whatever, your air conditioners up over 11 kilowatts. Um, and all in a fairly nice, nicely packaged uh, device that hangs on the wall typically in your garage. So that was um, almost not... Um, dealt with in the announcement, uh, but was a key part of it. Um, of course, what made the, um, the big uh, news was the um, solar tiles. And that's Elon Musk's very correct, and I've said this before, assessment of the need for mm, home solar power has to go to actually integrating the roof and the solar power, and he's come out with um, essentially glass shingles um, of several different designs, an Italian at terracotta looking one, a slate uh, looking one, a very modern black gloss one, um, and um, several other designs um, to um, make the roof itself solar. Why is this important, or why was this uh, uh, kind of a, a thing that Elon seemed to grasp that others don't. Solar City in selling their solar panels on your roof kept running into a problem. And that is that a roof typically will last for 15 or 20 years. Um, they are setting up a contract to do solar uh, on a 20 year contract. Well, if your roof is 12 years old, you can't put solar panels on it for a 20 year contract and then have to change the roof at the end of eight years when it already has solar on it. This is very awkward. We faced exactly the situation here at EVTV with an ancient building that was built in 1946, terrible roof on it, and I had to spend $35,000 putting a white uh, EPDM rubber roof, basically, on the building before we could start any considerations of solar power. And that EPDM roof has worked out extremely well. It reflects sunlight. Uh, the temperature in the building, which is not air conditioned in the shop area, dropped 15 degrees uh, the minute, the, the exact time that they were spreading the white rubber roof and rolling it over the top of the building simply because it reflected um, sunlight uh, much better than the black roof that was on here. And so you have to, if you're going to put in solar, you really need to replace your entire roof and then put solar on the roof. Um, Elon is proposing that for new or uh, renovation applications that they simply develop um, a roofing material that is in itself solar. And so they're coming out with these, a very attractive, I thought very attractive, 
um, solar tiles uh, to make the roof itself of. And so you don't have the separate issue of the roof and the solar and have a nice looking roof and then some black solar panels on it. And, uh, and so I was uh, very taken with this very progressive uh, and I think ultimately terrifyingly successful um, move into solar power that is going to take Tesla, Solar City combo uh, into a whole new uh, world. Let's take a look at this video and see what you think. Hey everybody. My name is uh, Lyndon Rive. I'm the CEO of Solar City. I'm very excited about the products we're going to be announcing today. Uh, the products you'll see is a joint collaboration between Solar City and Tesla. I want to thank the team for really putting this together in, in such a short amount of time. Really appreciate their help in getting this done. Um, but to really understand the vision, let's welcome Elon Musk. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> yeah, no, no fuzzy jacket this time. Um, so the, I will start off uh, by just talking about the, the reason why we're doing this, uh, which is, uh, as you may have read, uh, we're re reaching record CO2 levels. Um, global warming is becoming uh, a serious, is a serious crisis, and, and we need to do something about that. Um, the, the, but just like with electric cars, where you know, uh, electric cars originally, were, they, they didn't look good, they had low range, they didn't have good performance, um, they were like a golf cart, and so people had a real, real hard time buying electric cars. And uh, I think, you know, something similar needs to happen to, to solar. We really need to make solar panels as appealing uh, as, as electric cars have become. And the, you know, like the interesting thing is the houses you see around you are all solar houses. I don't know if you know that. I don't know if you, did you notice? Yeah. 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 So we're talking in, in detail about, about each of them, but the the goal is to make have have electric or you know solar roofs that look better than a uh, normal roof, generate electricity, have, last longer, have better insulation. Um, and actually have a cost, an installed cost, that is less than a normal roof plus the cost of electricity. So then, then why would you buy anything else? So let's get into, we're gonna get into the details here. So obviously you saw the, the chart there, probably you're familiar with, with the, that, that chart that came from, from NASA about how we're, we're in vertical climb on CO2 levels. Um, and uh, we, we need to do everything we possibly can to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. Save us, Elon! <laughs> <laughs> That's right. uh, so so the, the goal of Tesla, Tesla, people sometimes think of Tesla as an electric car company, but, but really the, the, the whole purpose of Tesla was to accelerate the advent of sustainable energy. Um, it's, not as like, it's not like there was a shortage of car companies in the world. There are plenty of good you know, gasoline car companies. Um, but there, there weren't good electric cars. That's, that's really what, what was needed. So there are really three parts to the solution. Um, so we go to what, what is the future that, that we want? Um, it consists of a, a really appealing solar roof, um, then combine that with, with storage and with electric cars. So it's, a three, it's an obvious three-part solution. Yeah, three-part solution. <laughs> Um, it's, it's really not that complicated. Um, now, you need battery packs because the sun does not shine at night. Um, and w the, the point that we're at right now is, in fact, obviously a transition. We're tra transitioning from day to, to night. It's dusk. Um, and so what, what, what's happening is that the, the houses are transitioning from the roof generating power to the battery pack, the, 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 the power wall, producing power. So uh, during the day, you fill up the, the battery, and then at night, and in dusk and dawn, you, you use the battery. Um, it's pretty straightforward, really. It's like, <laughs> not that complicated. Um, you, need, you just need, you need both. Uh, 
And, but, but if you have sol a great solar roof and you have a, a battery pack in your house and you have an electric car, that's something that scales worldwide, that you can, you can solve the whole energy equation with that. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, next slide, please. So, so we'd like to introduce the Powerwall 2. The, th this is a, a big step above the Powerwall 1. Um, it has twice as much energy, um, uh, more than twice as much power. So it's a 14, uh, 14 kilowatt hour energy storage, 7 kilowatt uh, power output. Um, and just to put that in, in basic terms, uh, you can take a four bedroom house and you can have uh, you, can, you can power the, your, your fridge, the sockets, and lights uh, for a day. And if you have solar on your, on your, on your house, you can power it indefinitely. So that's just with one. Um, and, and then we're, for, on the utility side, we've got the Power Pack 2, which similarly doubles the, the, uh, the energy. So it's a 210 kilowatt hour uh, capability, 50 kilowatt uh, uh, power output, and this, th this can scale to unlimited size. So it's, uh, uh, in fact, we've, we've recently announced the, the, the biggest uh, utility uh, battery installation uh, in the world, which is going to be with uh, Southern California Edison. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so we, we have an 80 megawatt hour uh, battery installation that's being built right now. So. And then uh, we, we announced one earlier this year, which is for uh, a utility in Hawaii uh, doing 52 megawatt hours. You're going to see a lot more of these uh, announced over time. And I think, I think it's important to uh, make sure people appreciate that the solution is both uh, local power generation and utility uh, power generation. It's not one or the other. Uh, sometimes this, this, the solar roof uh, is positioned as, as a sort of a competitor to, to utilities, but uh, we, we're actually going to need uh, utility power to increase, um, and we're going to need local power generation. Because if you transition um, all um, energy to, to electric, uh, that, that roughly triples the amount of electricity that's needed. So um, you need about a third for transport, about a third for heating, and about a third for what we currently use as electricity. So the, the, the future is, is bright for utilities and for, uh, for, for local power generation. Um, I would expect it to be roughly a, th a third local power generation, roughly two thirds uh, utilities. So it's, it's a, I think it's a very bright future for, for utilities and for rooftop. So let's look at, take a look at some of these roofs. What, as I mentioned earlier, what we're really looking for here is how do we have a, a solar roof that is better than a normal roof, um, that uh, looks better, uh, lasts longer, has better insulation, in, insulating effect, and where the cost of roof plus electricity is, is less than that of a normal roof. Now, this is, um, this is sort of the integrated future. You've got a electric car, a power wall, and, solar, and a solar roof. And the key is that it's, it needs to be beautiful, affordable, and, in, and seamlessly integrated. Um, and then if, if, if all those things are, are true, why would you go any other direction? So. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> so we're going to show you, this is the before shot of that house over there. So, so that's what it looked like before. Now that's um, all solar. Nice. Yeah. I think we've got some close-up shots that we can show. And if you, look, if you look carefully, you can actually see the, the solar cells behind the glass. So this is a textured glass tile. Um, if you look carefully, you can see the solar, the solar cells. Yeah, you can see that. So we have a malfunction on the LED. <laughs> so. Let's look, take a look at the next house. Right, so th that house is also solar, um, and that's a, a sort of a style of a, of a French slate, 
which is one of the hardest things to, to do. It's, it's considered one of the, the best roofs you can possibly do as a conventional roof. So we said, well, if, can we make a French slate roof that's solo that looks as good or, or better than a, than a conventional uh, French slate roof? And we're able to do that as well. Um, th that's done with hydrographic printing. So each tile is unique. So it's, it's, uh, the, the production process itself makes each tile especially unique, a sort of special snowflake tile. Um, the, the, uh, but the nice thing is that no two roofs will be the same. So it's not just cookie cutter. Uh, you, you can take any two roofs like that, and they will look different, because they are different. So. This is the, so what the French slate hydrographic looks like. You can see that. And then uh, this, the, the third house is really transformative. Because um, believe it or not, that's what it looked like before. So we, we changed the roof, and it was like, whoa, we put that roof on, we've got to change the house, too. <laughs> so that, that, you know, that, that tile is, is more of a modern look. Um, And here you can really see, as the angle changes, that you can see the solar cells. Um, so um, here we, we, we put a, a film with microlubers on it so that as, as the angle changes, it goes from transparent to opaque. So uh, from the vantage point of the street or anywhere near the house, it looks completely opaque. But from the sun, it's, to, to the sun, it's transparent. And then um, probably the, the most surprising one is the, the Tuscan, Tuscan glass. So this is also solar panels. But we've put two versions of the, the, the Tuscan glass approach. Um, all of the dark tiles have solar panels. So we interleave a dark and light, and then the dark ones are the, the ones with solar panels. Again, you can see that uh, the transparency changes quite a bit. So as you, fr from the sun's vantage point, which tends to be high angle, you can see the, the, solar, pa the solar cells. But as you change the angle to a shallow angle, uh, it reverts to um, a, a sort of an orangey color. <laughs> So, so one of the other advantages of, of glass is that we can actually make it a lot, a lot tougher and last a lot longer than a conventional roof. Uh, so we just as a demonstration video, show you what happens if you drop a, drop a big weight on a conventional roof tile and one of our glass tiles. So. So, so the, the solar roof won't just, uh, we want it to look better, last longer, provide better insulation, and cost less, all things considered, than a conventional roof. Um, There's the, the still a, a, a huge market for uh, the current solar systems, because the, if, you, if you're building a new house um, or you're redoing your roof, then this is the way to go. Um, but if, you're, uh, if you have a, a new roof, then you're obviously, you'd, you'd want to put solar panels on that roof. So there's, there's two very distinct markets. And there's about a four to five million uh, new roofs in the US every year. Um, and I think 20 times that number worldwide. Um, so you can imagine over time, 
as people replaced their roofs with solar roofs, that the whole neighborhood, would, would every, everyone would have solar. Like, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you? Over time, every, every house would, would become a solar house. Um, and it's, it's a neighborhood where the aesthetics actually get better. So where you look around your, your neighborhood, and that's what you want to have happen. Um, so I mean, the, the, the key is really to make, to make solar something desirable, where if you install a solar roof on your house, um, you're really proud of it. You want, you want to put it on the most prominent part of the house. You want to call your neighbors over and say, check out, check out the sweet roof. Um, <laughs> it's like not a phrase that you hear often. Um, but but, that, but that's, that's the key to it. People, people really care about their homes. They love their homes. Um, and, and they really want, they want them to be better. Um, and I think taking this approach, it, it can be. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that's, that's where we're headed. Um, and I hope you agree that's the future we want. Thank you. Many of you may have seen that video earlier, but I did want to include it. I think it's uh, probably one of the most uh, um, profound announcements of Elon Musk and the SpaceX, Tesla, Solar City uh, triumvirate there. Um, the next one of similar import will be when he announces his gigabit internet Skynet which is really what the whole SpaceX thing is about. 
but um, I was um, stunned to see the uh, uh, how quickly they came up and how uh, visually attractive um, those uh, roofing materials are. I can't wait for them. I'm embarrassed to report that we're doing the same thing as Tesla with a charge controller, an inverter, a power wall battery system, although it's in a box, and uh, a solar roof, except ours is kind of all done with big clunky Chinese stuff and Panasonic uh, solar panels and uh, um, kind of in the existing way of doing it where um, Elon's vision in incorporates a future um, innovation that will be much more elegant and, uh, and much more uh, usable. But let me show you what we're doing, uh, putting uh, another 13 kilowatt hours of solar on the uh, roof here at EVTV to use uh, to charge our fast charge system and our battery system um, there in the shop. Let's take a look. We're here on the roof of EVTV, setting up for the solar installation. Bill is about to lift us up these solar panels. First he's, first he's going to lift up these support brackets for the solar panels. Clear. The 
idea is going to be uh, basically duplicate what the system is we've got going on over there. I think we're going to do a run of four long or four wide and then it'll be about 10 long. We've got 40 panels in total. All right, so up here on the roof, I'm reminded of that scene out of Shawshank Redemption right after the guy tries to get the, the uh, warrant, the, the guy, the, the, the prison officer to uh, do his taxes and in exchange for getting his taxes for free, lets him work up on the roof for a, a beautiful fall afternoon. It's a pretty mighty, it's a mighty nice day to be working on a roof. So what we got going on here, we're gonna be doing another solar panel array. Um, we're going to have five rows of eight panels um, working at is it 308 volts. I believe it's 308 volts. I might be wrong on that, but five and a half amps. And we're going to have five uh, runs going down into the building into a circuit breaker box, kind of run in reverse. Uh, so we got eight panels in series, five rows of those total of 40 cells. And then we're going to be running that straight into our uh, charge controller that we talked about last time and then straight into the battery box. The way these racks work is from a company called Dino Racks. Um, and it's a really simple system. It's pretty intuitive. There's a there's a little pin with a with a little um, little catch right here. And basically you just you put this pin in, you set the rack up, put it in the hole, and it is that easy. That's all there is to it. And then you come and you match it up to the next one. Say it's this one. You come, you put that pin in, and just like that, you've got the proper angle for a flat roof. It's a pretty intuitive system. And then for the panels themselves, we've just got some little clips up here. These slide, one on the top, one on the bottom. So you can adjust for the size of the solar panel. And then you just slide the, the frame of the solar panel underneath here, and then slide this underneath that, and it locks it in place. There's four of those per rack. And that is kind of what we've got going on here. I'll see if I can get this camera off the stand and okay, so show you what we've done so far. Oh, I'm gonna do a little Blair Witch on you, sorry about that. So here we are at the other end of the roof. You can see what we've got going so far. We've got our Dyna rack systems all set up. So far we've got two rows of eight, cell, of eight uh, panels like I mentioned. And eventually we're gonna have five rows going all the way over there. Here's where the, the ends come out here, come out over there. Of course, we're gonna have five of those. We'll make up some, some solar cable that'll run all the way around here, roughly over there. We'll drill a hole in the ceiling, run some conduit down, and then that'll meet up with our, with our circuit box on the inside. From there, we can do what we need to with it. Why'd you put bricks down, Bill? We put some bricks down to hold the panels in the event of a strong wind or something. Um, it's probably a little overkill, but we kind of like that here at EVTV. If you can, if you notice the way this works, we've got one panel spanning across one rack there and then onto the leg of the second rack here. So we've got one panel going across essentially a rack and a half and then each panel repeats that as we go across the roof so if a strong wind were to come along 
it would have to pick up the entire array of panels. Um, but you know, overbuilding is always appropriate. Uh, over on this other side, you see the other array that you get to see from a drone perspective, but here it is from the ceiling perspective. Same situation, same racking system, the dyno racks. And this particular one has more. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven times one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So 70, 80. Looks like we've got 80 cells up here if I counted right. This one all goes into the grid, of course, as standard practice. Our new ones will go into our battery bank completely off of the grid. Here we have a uh, drone shot of our uh, completed solar edition, um, 40 Panasonic HIT 315 watt um, panels. Um, they're in five uh, strings of uh, eight panels each. Um, each string uh, has an open circuit voltage of about 525 volts, 480 volts at 5.5 amps. And um, with five strings, that gives us about 27 and a half amps, 13 and a half kilowatts of uh, power. You can see the cabling routed over to the edge of the roof where it goes through a uh, coupler uh, down through the roof and, and then a conduit down the wall to a new circuit breaker panel that we have uh, installed to handle this. Okay, Bill, you guys did a hell of a job on that. Uh installing the panels on the uh, roof. Went well. You almost killed Jack Crane. <laughs> Nobody liked him anyway. Well, <laughs> I kind of liked him. Uh, the, uh, I'm glad you didn't spill him off the forklift. So you put together the things using my idea with a white rubber membrane. Your idea was horrible. Was it? <laughs> that happens sometimes. <laughs> and then, uh, you did it with my revised idea, which is the way that they did the other side. It's way better idea. Dino racks? Dino racks, yep. How do you like that dino racks? How can you not like them? They're just a really intuitive, quick put together, no tools needed. I knew it the first time I saw them, but they were such a pain in the ass to deal with. But this time, not so. They just, we sent them a check. They sent us a mm. stack of cheap fiberglass uh, things, and it really wasn't that bad. About three thousand dollars for uh, enough to do forty panels. That's right. So under a hundred bucks a panel, seventy-five bucks a panel, I mm. guess. Um, and uh, did you have all the pieces and piece parts? Yeah, they even sent some extra. We had extra pins, and we even had an extra little fiberglass thing. So, so we installed uh, five um, sets of eight panels. Yeah. And that's, what, open circuit, maybe 525 volts? Uh, like yeah, when the sun's shining, about 520, 530. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, at the MPPT voltage on those is what, about uh, 60? Uh, that sounds about right, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and so they brought them all over here. Now this is where the whole solar energy thing breaks down. Uh, it starts to look like regular work. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's fun installing the panels, right? It, well, yeah, it was. It was good. It was something new, something different. And then we got over here and we're just dropping wires down the wall. Yeah, running PVC. And what we did was put in a uh, circuit breaker panel. Now that's pretty normal, except we're using it all bass backwards <laughs> and right. upside down. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so. Uh, I see you've got our map there. You get, ah, danger high voltage. Mm -hmm. And we need a DC 525 or something on that okay. door. All right. Because we don't want anybody to think this is an AC power mm -hmm. panel. Because it's way not. <laughs> no. no. And so we had five sets. What we did was put in, uh, oh, about, I'd guess, five um, 240 volt circuit breakers. And why did we do that? Uh, the 240 volt circuit breakers are double circuit breakers side by side. 
each side of your panel is normally one AC phase. So we took, uh, so one, two, forty, the left side is like the left side of the panel and the right side is like the right side. So we put the positive on one side and the negative on the other. Yep. And you did bring a ground wire down and ground it soft, yep. didn't you? Yep, ground down. Yeah, just for the frames. Yeah, the frame ground, yeah. So each circuit breaker is one set of eight panels. Yep. 525 volts. And it goes into the two lugs of the 240 volt circuit breaker. And that gives us left and right. Now, I don't know how I come up with this. This is so stupid. So the normal circuit breaker panel, you have your two phases coming in through a switch at the top. Well, that's where we're taking ours out. <laughs> Why not? And um, so we can individually switch the five solar banks. And they all feed into a common bus of positive and negative. And that goes out through the top switch and then comes down here to our Sandy solar controller. And the Sandy solar controller has a couple of well-labeled inputs, solar plus and minus, that's mm -hmm. pretty easy. And then battery plus and minus. And what we've done over here is Bill's put us a little electrical box with the Rebling battery connector. Yep. And we made up a cable with one of those on each end. And so it's not permanent, it's just a cable. We can plug it in here and plug it into the battery yep. and uh, charge it solar. Right now it's going into the box where we would plug in our charger. I mean our Chatamo the Chatamo charger. charger yeah. Uh, we'll add a second Rebling to yep. that box so we can charge it solar um, without disconnecting the Chatamo. Hmm. But the solar controller, I'd love to give you a step-by-step -step in Chinglish of how it works. <laughs> but first, I'm not exactly sure. And second, it's pretty trivial. You have an overcharge voltage you want to set an equalization charge voltage you want to set, and a float voltage you want to set. The overcharge, obviously, it's charging. And the way this does is it quits, and then it tries to charge again, and then it quits, mm. and it beeps each time, which is quite annoying. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it does kind of the same at equalization. We have that set. We have overcharge at 384, equalization at 383, and you can set an equalization time. And on lead acid batteries, you want to keep holding them there for a certain amount of time so all the cells can get into hydrolysis and you can equalize your pack. Hmm. We don't do any of that. No, we don't want to do that. We, we don't have hydrolysis and we don't have equalization. Hmm. So then it has a time you can set it from 10 to 120 minutes. Yep. We set it for 10 because that's the minimum. <laughs> that's all we can do. It wouldn't let us go below 10. And then you have a float voltage, which it will try to hold it at. And I think we uh, set that at 365 for right now. Uh, and then there's some recovery voltages where after it hits them, when they fall to that, they would pick back up. And of course, we've got those down at 320 or 330, something mm. like that. Um, and so, we kind of have to talk to it a little bit as if we knew what a lead acid battery was about, <laughs> but we don't. And we're trying to get it to charge a lithium battery. The important part is that it not overcharge. And we can actually turn on these circuit breakers one by one and see the current step up. We're wrapping up about 515 today right now. That's not exactly full sun. So we're getting about five and a half amps um, at 383 volts. Again, our solar photovoltaic voltage is, what is it? 
Oh, well, right now, about 380. We're charging <laughs> at uh, about 0.3 amps. We've reached our voltage, but about 525 volts. And it will step that down to your pack voltage, but it also tries to maintain the maximum power point tracking for that to occur. Mm. And so this little unit does it pretty well. The, the unique thing about it, it was very difficult to find uh, because it charges at, uh, as you can see here, 383 volts. Everything in the universe wants me to have a 48 volt battery pack or a 36 volt battery pack, 24 volt battery pack. I don't want to have that. We drive electric cars and the packs are between three and 400 volts. Um, typically got a few down in the high 200s. Um, I've got some that are 120 volts. We're kind of leaving them in the past with our AC systems. So we need solar that will let us deal with pack voltages in the electric vehicle range. We're going to put this in the uh, um, store and sell them at $995. Oh, I see those midnight solars for 48 volt packs, mm -hmm. you know, for seven, fifty, eight hundred dollars, and none of them will do this. And so, um, if you want to build your own battery box, um, this is a pretty easy way. We've got 13 kilowatts of panels on the roof. This unit will do 30 amps uh, at up to 400 volts. It's easily over um, 12 kilowatts and uh, that's quite a bit of solar. We have uh, just under 25 doing the whole building. Mm. And so now we've got uh, 12, 13 um, doing charging duties for the thing. We're going to get an inverter and be able to use it to augment our uh, AC power too. You wanna stay with us for that. But right now we've got a $995 Genuine Chinese, complete with Chinglish instructions, um, but it's a pretty basic uh, device. We're hooking up solar panels to it, hooking it up to a battery and telling it not to go above a certain charge and, um, and hoping that it does that in kind of the maximum power point tracking way mm -hmm. so that we get the most out of our solar panels while we're charging our charger. That's the gig. What do you think, Bill? I think it's pretty cool. Is um, this gonna work? Well, it is. It's showing itself to work. <laughs> so I'm a fan of anything that's off-grid, and that's definitely what this is. Bill's shopping for land to start his uh, <laughs> off-grid home style. That's right. Uh, tiny house nation <laughs> combined with an electric pickup truck and uh, yeah. uh, enough solar to run his house plus four times that much solar to run the his truck. The truck, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Because, of course, he'll be living out of town <laughs> to do all this. Yeah. And, uh, no, it's a good dream. And a lot of people are working that these days, and I think it's, uh, it's all good medicine. Stay with us. We've got here our battery box hooked up to our Chatamo charge station. Bill tells me we need to take down the battery so we can do some tests on the solar charger. And um, he wants to replace two cells that are kind of hot when we're charging, meaning they have sort of a short capacity. <coughs> if we replace those two cells, we'll be able to do more damage, but we want to, what, bottom balance pack. <laughs> so, he suggested that I bring in the Tesla, take it away from my wife again, which she's all happy about today, and uh, let's uh, charge it using the Chatamo and thereby drain this battery down. I got the Tesla at 29% charge. So it, this is a 33 kilowatt pack, maybe. <laughs> Give or take. Meaning that we can take all of it. <laughs> right. And then Bill can put in two cells and then we can charge it up using the new uh, solar charge controller and 40 uh, Panasonic HIT 19.4% 
efficient solar panels that he and the lads have uh, put on the roof. I don't do roofs, of course, <laughs> but um, if I fell off a roof, I don't know what would happen. There's a little thing in the upper right hand corner, Bill. Yeah, let's do that. Plug us in and let's see if we can get her charging. We have to use our RFID. We're down to 9,998 credits or something. I don't know what we do when we run out. And away we go. I'm having 0.4 amps. Whoops. Or 119.1 amps. And standing right here by the battery in case it blows up in Bill's face, it'll take mine first. He's got new religion about batteries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so starts at 115, goes off completely, comes back up. Now it's at 120. Now what's interesting is we're at 118.6. We're also at 332 volts. The battery pack was up around 360, but we're sagging it down because we're taking 120 amps out of this thing. So we're at 331. But what are you at on the machine? Uh, the machine is saying we're charging at 356.8 with 106 amps going in. Excellent. So we're we're using a boost circuit. It'll have in those five things they have active devices, capacitors and uh, or I guess they're passive devices, capacitors and coils and it forms a boost circuit. Mm. And so we're actually stepping the voltage up and the current then goes down to transfer approximately the same power uh, in there but we're at uh, 356.4 volts and charging at 106 amperes. We're already up to 30% in the car. And at 30% in the car. Um, at that rate, that's about 35 kilowatts. Uh, 36, 37 kilowatts an hour. Um, this is supposed to be a 50 kilowatt device, but that's uh, constantly what you get. Mm. Um, we're probably getting 40. Would we get more amps out of it if this was a bigger pack of 400 or 500? No. We have plenty of voltage and plenty of current. Um, the devices themselves are uh, not 100% efficient. Okay. Uh, so you lose about 10%. So 50 kilowatts gets us down to 45 just on efficiency. Okay. You know, I'm I'm calculating from what's going in, and uh, let's do that more precisely with the magic cell phone calculator. 356.9 times 105. 0.4, and that's 37,617 watts out of a 50 kilowatt device purportedly. Um, I'm used to that sort of abuse on specifications. <laughs> I don't even take exception. And that's not China or the U.S. Not that's even just, offended anymore. You pay your, your money and that's about the percentage of what they told you you were going to get that you actually get. <laughs> I'd say that's about right, 75%. Um, um, if I get 75 cents on the dollar uh, value for what I pay, I'm probably at it again. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm kind of a Republican that's really a libertarian. If I was a Democrat, of course, I'd want 150%, mm. but it has to be somebody else's money. Sure, of course. <laughs> the... Uh, Oh, you, you've been in here. They just announced an hour ago. Comey 
is reopening the FB, the email thing. They found <laughs> some more emails. Did they now? The fun never ends. Didn't this they is a reality TV show. Didn't they shut down WikiLinks or something like that? They reopened it or something? Well, no, they uh, they cut his internet access off, thinking that might do something. All oh, right. This is the level of the people running our government. Yeah. Uh, Barack Obama and John Kerry hatched a plot to pressure Ecuador to cut off his internet, thinking that would shut off the leaks. Right. The WikiLeaks is an organization that operates in Holland, Germany, Global. the Netherlands, yeah. um, Switzerland, uh, and 12 other countries. Yeah. Uh, but not Ecuador, who was the one granting him asylum. And um, so it was the kind of effective leadership even in being cowardly and um, really corrupt, mm. they're in that. They don't know what they're doing. They he's, try to shut it off. They think they, they've got it shut off. He's probably pretty computer savvy himself, so he could probably not too worried about that either. Well, right. No, they were <laughs> interviewing him today uh, on uh, YouTube. And uh, But anyway, I, I think Julian Assange is a hero. I contributed $1,000 to WikiLeaks. Mm. I think uh, Trump ought to pardon him, give him a, a political asylum in the U.S. from all this persecution that they're, uh, 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 he's being politically persecuted by the U.S. Now, how mm. that works, I don't know. But And then grant him a presidential pardon, citizenship, and probably a pension. Yeah. That'd be cool. Maybe he could work here. Yeah, he could. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Give him an H-1 visa yeah. and we'll take him. <laughs> and uh, so here we go. We've already done 3.83 kilowatts and we've been charged, or 3.87 and been charged 3.87 something. I don't know if it's a euro, a, a one, um, an RMB, or a... Uh, dollar but well, we got 9978 of them left so fortunately we're pretty well fixed yeah we're good i guess you got to trade this in for a new one when that runs out. I, I suppose when you get to that you have to call and buy more credits or something <laughs> i don't know the uh, but we're having fun with chinese solar and charging equipment yep. and so this is our battery that bill built and the boys painted and this is a uh, charge station that we got from a company that I've ordered further equipment from them. I, receive. I get regular emails from people wanting to know if they can just buy it directly from them. I'm like, be my guest. <laughs> There's a reason people buy stuff from us, guys. Yeah, you can beat us out of a couple of bucks. However, in dealing with the Chinese and the Americans, this all started when I lost $10,000 on a battery deal mm. with some guys in Issaquah, Washington. And so did like 43 other guys. Wow. And so they wanted me to handle parts. <laughs> now it's gone on long enough that people have forgotten, but I get pants all the time. So you don't have to. You gotta pay me to do that. <laughs> so we'll get them make sure they work and sell them to you. If you want to buy them directly, take 12 weeks to get them, have them shipped overseas, and sometimes they never do send you anything or it arrives broken. Uh, it, you go, girlfriend. It's, or it uh, arrives so late you forgot what it was, why you ordered it, what you were supposed to do with it. We'll chat over coffee. I do this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun. I'm famous among the Chinese. Mm -hmm. The uh, <laughs> So... Anyway, that's uh, the deal, and then we're going to finish discharging this this uh, battery into the car, hopefully do a quick change on two cells, and get her back on the solar panel. Mm. It's 2 o'clock now. We're still not going to get peak sun today. No, we missed it. Yeah. That was my fault. But someday we'll get it actually with the sun shining directly overhead and see what it really puts out. Anyway, we're having fun charging our Tesla on sunshine. From the sun. And that's, uh, that's kind of our mission over the next few months. Stay with us. And so there you have it. Um, we um, have got um, 
really all the pieces uh, we just received today. The inverter, which we did not cover, but we have the solar panels, 40 um, Panasonic HIT 315 watt panels on the roof in five sets of eight panels, um, about 525 volts open circuit, uh, 480 at the maximum power point. Uh, each string and so we'll get about five and a half amps uh, per string um, maybe 27 28 amps maximum uh, at 480 volts uh, 13 and a half kilowatt um, installation increasing our total solar by 50 percent um, to about 37 kilowatt at kilowatts of uh, solar panel array on the roof and we're going to use this um, 13 kilowatts uh, to charge batteries and cars and um, that's going to take some build out on the ground in the shop and we showed you a little bit at the beginning of that i'm kind of hoping to crack the uh, tesla battery um, not as modules, but as an entire unit with the BMS and perhaps even the cooling um, such that we can uh, use those. Um, we would probably never use them in a car, but we, we would use them um, for solar storage. Um, and I'd like to be able to take them out of the car and not spend a lot of time and effort um, uh, revising them, but just take the um, the battery as is and plug it in and that would be ideal so that's where we're going with the solar let's um, Colin and I continue to uh, work on version 6.22 of the JFQ we now have those for sale in the um, um, store I've only got about 15 of them but we've got another hundred on the way uh, from China and we're um, still working on some of the software um, with the Bluetooth module and so forth, but it certainly can be used to drive a car. And we, uh, Bill um, uh, Bayer and uh, Dylan uh, uh, Freeze have been working on the uh, green thing, which uses the UQM power phase. Um, drive system and we have gotten that to first roll and have taken a test drive in it uh, to get some uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Let's take a look. This is the first roll of the uh, 1974 VW thing, the green one with UQM Power Phase 100. rolling and this really is the first roll. Never move this in anger. Seems very smooth at a low speed. Okay, we're here in the uh, green thing. And we're going to uh, take a drive. First thing I'm going to show you is the Andromeda interfaces. Ink. Uh, they call it an EVIC electric vehicle interface, something or other. You can see there we have 291.7 volts and 0% battery. I need to work on that. 25 degrees C on the motor, 28 C on the uh, controller. The uh, green thing is a little bit of an embarrassment in that uh, 
we've been working on it for years. Um, today's kind of a cool thing. This Evic, we now have our, oh, there's 98% battery. This Evic um, works with our GEVQ, Generalized Electric Vehicle Control Unit. And um, it's, uh, we're going to the new 6.2 version we have a yellow thing with the Siemens and the Mach 645 and we have the uh, green one now with the UQM power phase 100 the reason I'm a little embarrassed is that we've sold actually quite a few of the UQM power phases with the Chev Q but we haven't actually had a vehicle rolling in anger with that uh, device on it um, so we're finally up with two nearly identical vehicles with two different drivetrains to use as test beds for the um, JevQ, um, which of course have different object modules for each of the things. Let's see if it'll uh, move a little bit. It seems like it wants to. This steering wheel is a little small for me. I'm going to try to get Mel to put a... Uh, the W Carmen Gia one. Well, here we've got. What happened? Screens, the films are, the gimbal's all crooked. Well, you work on that. All right. That's our drone, which isn't uh, working too well. It's kind of a learning curve. I might get somebody that knows how to work it. They leave me. I'll get somebody new. You hear that squeak back there? <laughs> me or you, I think. You think? It might be, but it's really annoying. You know, right? Anyway, we're rolling. I actually made this drive with one camera. And, uh, it didn't come out, we had no audio. Today we've got three cameras, two microphones. Uh, and a beautiful October day to do it on. And we're off to get me some Kentucky Fried Chicken. For lunch. And we've got regenerative braking. Of course. Tune this up for Bill. Here. Oh, that's stuck. Good showing current. Showing regen. Showing regen. So we can see all that on our every screen. I guess if I look down to watch all that, I'll be dead, but it's actually the first day of November. Had a uh, beautiful fall weather, but the worst uh, tree fall I can ever remember. Just no color to it. No, it's not nice, is it? Sure, well, it's probably global warming. That's what Leo says. It's caused our leaves to uh, not do very well. But our green thing is banging along pretty nicely here. Well, nice and quiet. Er, well, my er, it's got some squeaks. But the uh, throttle feels very good. I saw, in fact, I talked to Matt Aubert. He's just done a thing and he makes the tires spin and the wheels smoke. And I guess I'm just like an old guy or something. The difference is, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Board, fatal accidents among people 55 and older are almost unheard of. 
they just don't have them. Well, you haven't had them yet, have you? No, I haven't had them. I haven't had an accident since I was a kid. Certainly not fatal. 19 years old. Yes, and it wasn't fatal. Probably should have been. Oh, the Plymouth over in Tennessee, seven died one night. After becoming a cricket rancher. Say cricket? Like, yep, the guy. Like grasshoppers? Actually, yep. Mm -hmm. I had a white van said, uh, I don't know, Hobbs Cricket Ranch or something on like it. Unlimited access highway. Over in Tennessee, saw me coming and stopped. Um, now he was over 55, but neither of us were killed, so. Again. <laughs> I doubt your statistics. Right. I question them. Uh, they were very real. Um, it's a pretty regular trim line. Right up to the 55 and older age group, and they almost disappear from the arena. Hmm. You're driving like a bat out of hell. Y'all killed us all the way on TV commercial. No. Guy with a 1959 Dodge doing about three and a half miles an hour. He's telling his wife, You're driving like a bat out of hell. You'll kill us all. <laughs> What do you want? I want a grilled chicken sandwich if that's possible. It's pretty possible. I think this is going to be Welcome back to my cafe. Please order when you're ready. I want a grilled chicken sandwich, three thighs, original recipe, and two biscuits. Sir, we don't have a grilled sandwich. Oh. Oh, then a chicken little sandwich. One of those. The chicken little sandwich, and that's a crispy tender. That's perfect. Yeah, I get a couple of those. They're pretty small. Two of them. Oh, you want some chicken little sandwiches? Yes. And what else would you like? <laughs> Three thighs, original recipe, and two biscuits. <laughs> it's hard not to laugh. All right, so I have some chicken little sandwiches only. A three-piece, three original thighs, and two biscuits, a total of 1021 at the first window. Thank you. Well, hold on now. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you guys was done. You know, I thought we were, too, and then I saw this sign that it's back. The Nashville Hot, and it's got pickles and something in there. Yes, it does. What is that? Um, it's a smoked flavor sauce that we drizzle over the meat. It's pretty good. All right, sign me up for one of those, too. Okay, what would you like with the Nashville Hot on it? You get one of those chicken little sandwiches that you have, or you can get your chicken, you can get one of your thighs, drizzled in um, the Nashville Hot, but your chicken will have to be crispy. Well, no, whatever this sign is here, it's got a, like a little bucket of chicken with pickles. Oh, uh, those are the tender? Yeah. Okay. And would you like the coleslaw that goes with it? Uh, sure. Okay, and that, and that, those three tenders do come with a, a, a biscuit also, so do you still want that extra biscuit? Yeah, I'm sure. All righty, and see you guys for you. No, I think that'll do it. Do you guys need any drinks? No drinks. Okay, so I have two chicken little sandwiches only, a three piece, two original thighs, and a biscuit, another extra biscuit. A three tender Nashville hot basket with two pickles, coleslaw, and a biscuit. Okay. So Sixteen fourteen at the first window. Thank you. All right. Well, it's rent day. I probably got it. <laughs> We're going for everything here at the Kentucky Fried Chicken. Throwing caution to the winds in our visit to the Colonel. Still haven't smoked any tires. 
in fact, we're driving in third gear. Mm. I'm doing pretty good. With that headset, you look like you're from outer space. I look like I'm from outer space? Yeah, you got lights on your head. We're recording this too, so don't do anything suspicious. I noticed, Jack, when we were sitting there doing that uh, order that you didn't have the brake on. You were using the gas pedal to hold us on that hill. I am. Everybody with a DC motor might frown at that. Should uh, the AC people frown also? You know, Bill, I don't know. Obviously, you're running a little current through there. Um, but you don't have the um, uh, brushes that you have with a DC motor and the commutator. So, I don't think it hurt hurts it too much, but I have to tell Hello. you. Hello, I have the two chicken little sandwiches only, a three piece with, with three original size, and the, well, two things get and then the three piece Nashville hot basket mm -hmm. with coleslaw. Okay, I have your napkins, utensils, and straw in the bag. Thank you, dear. Okay, have a nice day. You too. So, uh, I did pass that information along about the DC motors because George Hamster, the head of NetGain, who uh, did the uh, sort of uh, a redesign of the forklift motor for EV guys, and did an excellent motor. We sold a lot of them. We used a lot of them. We still have one in the uh, um, red uh, Speedster. Um, but he was adamant about that. Um, but I held it on the hill with the throttle in the Speedster. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can kind of see it in a DC motor because you're just holding that current through one set of windings on that armature. Whereas on a on the AC motors here, that field's still rotating, isn't it? So it's not, I don't know, there's no, I'm talking to myself smart. You know, you are, <laughs> yeah. You don't have um, the current through the brushes and um, you do have it through the spatter of uh, an AC induction. Of course, this has a what we call a brushless DC, but really it's simply a permanent magnet uh, rotor. And so you only have to run your three phases, your polyphase inverted output through the uh, static windings in the case of the motor. But I would say that it's, uh, I mean, it's where on the motor, uh, you don't have, uh, but the other thing is that DC motors are air-cooled, and the uh, AC motors are liquid-cooled, and some of it's just a heat function. All that said, our mission is to design and build a car that you use like a car. And that means uh, not a lot in the way of special instructions, uh, except where they offer a big advantage. Um, for example, I have an enable switch here and a uh, reverse switch on the uh, panel. The enable switch I never use, it's always left on, and you don't need it one at all, but it's another way of turning everything off in an emergency. Uh, but the reverse switch I love. I've got this thing in third gear. It's very smooth, particularly at low speeds in third gear. Um, and uh, so backing up, putting it in electric reverse, of course the transmission has a reverse. 
but I don't want to fool with it. I just press a button or in reverse and it will spin this backwards. So that's an example of a different control, but with a clear uh, advantage that, that is worth it. Uh, you have a switch on your truck, as I understand, to turn off regen. That's right. Don't. Yep. Um, so, I guess, uh, you know, we do make exceptions. There's a little honey trying to hurt me. <laughs> that she didn't. They did get that curve, though. <laughs> the reason she's unable to hurt me is I'm over 55. And so, I uh. can't uh, be involved in a fatal accident. Oh, okay. Well, um, Bob safe. I feel really safe now. Well, you, you're very safe because you're at 61 now. Can I get you to be my chauffeur? You like, know, always? probably so. Um, now, see, if you got in the harbor, you'd be burning the tires, and this ride would be a lot more fun. But yeah. he might kill you. Uh, well, that's the price, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, he's, uh, he's uh, coming into his. He's married now, has a baby girl, and he'll start uh, getting older. He's going to have to step up. Yeah, he's going to have to uh, have a different thing. So we haven't really talked much about oh. the car. Um, I guess we don't have to, and that's the point, and the point on holding my position with the throttle. One of the um, reasons I've come around so hard on that. Uh, AC motors is I like this one foot driving, don't you? Oh, I do. It's nothing better. I never want to touch a brake. Nope. I just uh, use that one foot. Like I say, I press a button and I'm in reverse. And it, it's actually a much easier car to drive. Of course, it's quieter. It's so quiet, I'm fussing at you over some spring noise yeah, right. in the back seat. Yeah, every single like, thing in the history. Have I got to put them. up with this the rest <laughs> of my life? What are you going to fix that, though? Squeak, squeak, I gotta find squeak. It. What's that about? Yeah. Yeah, get some lithium grease. Because <laughs> we like lithium. And, uh, well, yeah, I guess <laughs> whatever you need to lubricate it. Yeah. It doesn't uh, squeak at me that way. And so, uh, that's our drive. Just went to get chicken. I didn't do any fast driving. But it's very smooth. The throttle is very smooth. Um, when I do put on a brake, of course, this one does not have a brake pressure sensor tied in with the jib cube, unlike the yellow thing. And so, it's a little bit of a uh, different beast. Um, there are some differences between the two of them, but a similar weight vehicle, um, similar amount of batteries, um, and I never did check to see if our uh, speedometer works. I had it on there, going yeah. down the road. Yeah. It's uh, kind of an EVTV. Turn your lights on. Speedometer. You can see the lights. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Walk out the sun. Lip. So, between that and the Evic, uh, this one has kind of advanced displays. I have the same radio in both of them, which will work with my telephone. Um, if we get that working. And uh, so, we still have to do some work on the heater. And the plan for this vehicle is a little bit different in that uh, Jesse put a kind of a deluxe installation of a Chatamo charging inlet behind the VW on the front. And here to our left, you can see you're working on the uh, batteries. Um, we want to solar charge those. Got our inverter in today. and um, But we want to develop a um, using a JIVQ hardware um, kind of a uh, charge controller for Chatamo to do fast charge of this vehicle um, from our solar charged battery. And unlike the Tesla Model S, where we're trying to charge a 85 kilowatt battery from a 33 kilowatt battery, 
which we can do to some degree but in this case uh, what do we have in here 24 kilowatts I believe so and uh, charging from 33 kilowatt hour battery and so we'd be able to pull this one in completely empty and recharge it in seconds and now we have 36 degrees centigrade on our motor 36 degrees centigrade on our controller we're at 290 uh, volts and um, so now I'll put on the handbrake and take off my foot and uh, but I need to work on that battery um, uh, keeper it's uh, kind of wandering around 0%, 22%, 98% um, I, that's a code issue in the program and I just never did need to fix it because we didn't have a EVIC working mm. and we do now so this is our green thing with a UQ Empower Phase 100 and a JevQ 6.22 our new hardware that's working uh, very well Colin's been working on uh, we have a little problem between the Bluetooth low energy uh, module and um, it uh, kind of resetting the JevQ but he's got that mostly worked out um, we're having a lot of fun with the, the little hardware the little controllers and software uh, Jeff Stoffregen has recently released a new version of the Teensy uh, 3.6 this is a card this long that is basically an Arduino except with a 180 megahertz ARM Cortex M4 processor um, two CAN channels, EEPROM, a meg of uh, memory uh, it's just uh, uh, a monstrous step up from the Arduino Dewey we use and Colin's working on a board we can plug that into to get our can channel and uh, Dallas one wire temperature sensors um, hooked into that and the BLE module and with some success there we might use that in place of the JevQ hardware oh. for our Chatamo uh, controller oh that's cool just because we could <laughs> but we're getting in our Chinese hardware uh, including the, the solar charge controller we showed the other day and today a 10 kilowatt inverter I actually got the inverter today and it will invert without the grid right on it'll invert with the grid I believe it has a AC input too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um, it will also invert so it, it yeah it, it passes through the grid and it'll sync to that um, in producing it from the battery but uh, so we want to play with that but this gets us set up now we have both the green thing and the yellow thing working the yellow thing with the Siemens DMOC 645 the green thing with the um, UQM power phase 100 the CODA version I keep having people calling wanting to use the JevQ to uh, run the UQM power phase now it would do that you would have to write a module for it but the module we have for this is written for the CODA firmware that's in the uh, in the device and so um, it's it's kind of a peculiar thing of course that that actually lets UQM sell those to us and then us sell them to you for a little over half the price that mm. UQM gets for their production uh, power phase 100 and because it has different firmware in it there's no real cannibalization or crossover um, so that's kind of a, just an interesting result of them being stuck with seven and a half million dollars <laughs> worth of inventory <laughs> when Coda went bankrupt mm. in any developing technology um, a lot of the pioneers you find them laying alongside the trail with arrows in their back <laughs> and um, somehow we've gotten to be the ones that 
pick through their belongings after yeah. they're dead. And you running off with their wallet. <laughs> right. We get their wallet and their... And their, their ring and their watch. Yeah, ring and a watch and their boots. Yeah. Their knife and yeah. stuff. And so uh, that's uh, kind of what's been going on. Um, to the advantage of uh, some of our savvy um, viewers. Um, so there we go. The Avic's looking good, and uh, the vehicle looks good, and it feels good driving it. It does feel nice. You know, gotta fix that annoying squeak. Mm -hmm. that no thing driver in history has probably ever heard before. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave it to you to uh, smoke check the tires. I'm pretty confident of that. 100 kilowatt UQM, if you'll drop it into first or second, can uh, second it'll smoke the tires around the corner. <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if you put the brake on and uh, step on it, that's how they do that uh, drifting yeah. trick. So. Okay, well, give that a uh, shot. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna give that a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Save that for the Doka. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, there you go. Save that for the Doka. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's uh, do a little segment on, you know, we've never mentioned the uh, Tesla wheels on the Doka. Ooh. Let's take a look at that. So we're rolling in the green thing. That's uh, that's a pretty nice uh, gig. Um, and, um, and that gives us uh, two test platforms. Uh, for one for the Siemens uh, D Mach 645 in the yellow thing, and one for the uh, uh, UQM Power Phase 100 in the green thing, and lets us tune up our JevQ software um, using the Evic display now uh, in the green thing, and uh, and moving toward um, communication with. Um, smartphone devices uh, to configure the device and to display operating parameters. And so we'll continue to work on that. Um, we have had a couple of um, people inquire about uh, uh, problems they've had shorting terminals on batteries. I have to say that I've never heard of anyone being electrocuted by an electric car. I've never heard of anyone being electrocuted um, and, and dying from working on an electric car. Um, we get bit once in a while with a voltage, but it's uh, more like a wasp thing than anything serious. However, we do um, have a lot of power in these batteries. And the danger we do fight, and I uh, lecture the guys on here, uh, uh, quite a bit about, um, but somewhat less so on our videos, is the danger of fire and heat. And if you short a couple of these terminals, um, and we demonstrated this with like wrenches and so forth that uh, did it in a controlled fashion where they turn cherry red and melt and so forth, it's pretty serious um, if you short uh, terminals on adjacent rows of the battery that actually have some voltage behind it, it can um, can be pretty uh, catastrophic. Um, and the, the danger is burns. I had my hands both uh, fairly severely burned. Um, oh, it's been over five years ago. Bill Bayer uh, encountered the same um, delightful happenstance and suffered kind of the same uh, effect. And he has some thoughts on that now that uh, seem remarkably similar to some I may have expressed in the past. Let's take a look. All right, guys, here we are standing in front of the uh, green thing. I wanted to do a little piece about uh, some misfortune I had, oh, I don't know, about three weeks ago. Um, I was tightening some battery straps underneath it here. I found a couple of them are loose, so I went through the entire pack to, to tighten them all because uh, loose battery straps can can equal some pretty bad things. Uh, arcing of the terminals and melting of the, of the uh, straps themselves and uh, ultimately loss of your pack. So went through them all, tightened them all up and did pretty good. Got 88 cells, got to about number 80. And uh, I think I got a little bit comfortable. A coworker was standing next to me and we were talking about this or that or something else. And I was up under here tightening away as one does and 
made contact with one of the battery terminals and the uh, one of the terminals for this uh, the connector here on the end and basically got arc flash pretty bad. I got some pictures of it uh, after the event happened so we'll put some up here now to, so you can see what it looked like uh, ultimately after uh, my hands were all black. Um, the one thing that was kind of interesting is as soon as it happened it didn't hurt. It didn't hurt right away. Right away. Um, but I, couldn't, I also couldn't see, so after it happened, obviously we were a little terrified, our hearts were pounding. I looked around and I thought everything was fine because I was, I was blinded by the flash, but as it turns out, I was, I was burned pretty bad on, uh, on four of my fingers. Um, second degree burns definitely, uh, quite possibly third degree on my thumb. It's still, uh, it's still healing still. Um, so what's the takeaway of this? A couple things. Um, whenever I did this, I used this particular socket. I don't know if you can tell, but it's it's pretty mangled. We can get a picture of that up on the screen too. We got a we got a better shot of it as well. Um, and I was using this ratchet, which is about half good because it's insulated here. But the part that wasn't good is the ratchet, the um, socket itself was not insulated. How could I have how could I avoided this? Um, first of all, you need to pay attention to what you're doing. Um, you need to respect these battery cells. Uh, and these packs as a whole. There's a lot of voltage in there and there's a lot of amperage if you short circuit this. Uh, in this particular case, I was only dealing with this one pack, the rest of it was broke, so it was just this pack. But short circuiting this, I probably saw at least 2,000 amps um, and that'll make a pretty big flash. And it'll melt metal instantaneously and that metal will go kind of everywhere. I was lucky that it wasn't damaged further. Uh, how do you avoid this? Be aware of your surroundings, be aware of what you're doing, be conscious of everything. Avoid distraction when you can. Uh, a simple thing I could have done that would have made things all better, just put some wraps of tape around the socket. Put some wraps of tape around the ratchet. Just keep, make it so that there cannot be contact with metal parts. Uh, we sell in the store some of these industrial um, you know, these are safe up to like a thousand volts and they're, they're intended for this purpose just so you can't damage anything. You could drop this in there and it wouldn't, it wouldn't cause any problems. Um, another thing to, to do I should have done but wasn't, again, I was lucky, like Norm Abram says, some of these, your safety glasses. Because they could have been, sparks could have jumped up and got in my eyes. Um, let's see, what else? I think that pretty much takes care of it. Oh, some gloves. Some gloves would have been nice. In this case, I'm not sure if gloves would have been good or bad because of the flash, it would have melted the rubber. Maybe it would have got in my hands, I don't know, but if the other safety precautions were taken care of prior to having gloves, gloves are a good idea because at some point without gloves, you're going you're gonna to accidentally touch some terminals and it won't kill you, probably. I don't think anybody's ever actually died from getting direct current uh, run through them, but it certainly doesn't feel very nice and uh, gloves can help that too. Uh, long sleeves would probably be a good idea. Uh, certainly jeans, um, closed toe shoes, because if sparks come out, they land. So just generally shop safety is, is what we're getting at here. Um, so yeah, we just wanted to do a little bit on that. Uh, we're not really safety Nazis around here, but when it's prudent, we do like to, uh, to keep you guys informed and made things aware. So. Stay with us. I'm glad you're okay, Bill. And so that's um, the purpose of uh, wrapping our sockets in electrical tape or plastic dip or heat shrink is what I use a lot. Put a tube of heat shrink around them and hit them with a heat gun. Uh, I always use the stubby um, insulated um, socket. Uh, that's kind of to prevent stripping the soft threads in the battery. Um, but it's also if I uh, drop it in the battery box, it's unlikely that I would get metal to metal contact across different terminals. We have kind of a procedure for putting the straps on. We put the strap and then each of the bolts while holding the strap we thread on and we don't go near it with a ratchet until we have both thread both bolts threaded to keep it from flopping around under the pressure of the wrench and making contact with an adjacent roll. Eye protection is um, pretty much required. I don't 
wear gloves. I advocate their use, but I don't, frankly, wear them myself because I want to be able to feel what's going on. We wear no watches or rings around an electric car ever at all. We just don't wear them. If you get a metal wrist watch band across two terminals in one of these batteries, you get your arm back after the hand burns off and falls to the ground. So I don't, uh, I'm not a safety Nazi. We don't lecture on it very much, but I'm, uh, I'm glad Bill brought that up. Um, another little thing, it's, it's not a big deal, but we use 12 volts around here a lot of times and for everything. And we're constantly in a mode where we need 12 volts to test something. We've got high voltage battery packs everywhere, but we run out of 12 volts. Uh, and so the, uh, we found some little lithium 12 volt packs that are designed to jump an internal combustion engine car. That's not what I want to use them for. Uh, we want to use them, just have them around, keep them charged up, and use them for general purposes in uh, messing around with our, our cars and our testing our equipment and so forth. Um, and I asked Bill to take a look at some that I found in China. We have ordered in and are going to have in the EVTV web store for you to order. Let's take a look at what he's got. <laughs> All right, guys. Sitting here in the uh, shipping department. We've got a new product in a little while ago. Going to do a little product review on it. This is a, uh, a high power battery charger uh, from, from good old China, of course. Um, the idea is that if you had an internal combustion engine, which of course we don't like around here, but if you did have one, this little guy could get you out of a jam if your uh, 12 volt pack was uh, faulty. Apparently, according to the statistic, uh, the, uh, the specifications, we can get up to 600 amps peak or 300 amps uh, for your jump start. I haven't actually tried that. We don't have any uh, dead internal combustion engines around here. Um, so, but I'm guessing it's, it's probably good for a start or two in a little car. What we do have around here occasionally is some dead um, electric cars. And for those of you who haven't done a conversion, aren't very um, knowledgeable about it, sometimes electric cars do actually have a 12 volt battery in them. Uh, it's used for various things, mostly during startup, just to get some contactors going. Um, you know, to do pre-charge for inverters or, or whatever you might want to do with it. Um, during actual driving, we've got DC-DC converters that take care of that. But during, during the startup sequence, uh, sometimes a 12-volt battery is required. Uh, and they do go flat, or dead, as some people like to say. And, um, and if you don't have a little, you know, a little 12-volt battery hanging around, uh, this could be a good way to get yourself out of some trouble. Um, and also help a friend if they have an internal combustion with a dead battery, because then you could jump start them because electric vehicles, despite the energy in their batteries, aren't very good at jump starting 12 volt cars. Um, so what comes with this thing? A lot of stuff. Got some little, uh, little jumper cables. Uh, these are 10 gauge, so I wouldn't really want to put 300 and certainly not 600 amps through them for very long, but like I say, I'm sure, it, I'm sure it'd be good enough to at least get it going. Uh, and for our purposes, it'd be more than more than sufficient just to, to get everything rolling. Comes with the actual pack itself, comes with a whole bunch of little adapters, adapter cable, charger, uh, 12 volt for your car. The way this thing works, um, gum has got some on off, it's got an on off switch here, uh, you turn the power on, and then you got a little button here, and that, what that does is it cycles the voltage that comes out of here, and you can plug that into various accessories, computers, laptops, um, iPads, I'm guessing. There's a whole bunch of Apple looking adapters here. Um, also for cameras or whatever you might have, there's four USB outlets, each at five volts and two amps. Um, and then this output, like I say, is variable. It can either be 15, 16, or 19 volt, just depending on, on what your needs are. Um, the specifications for this has got uh, 16.8 amp hours, and it says it's an, a 3S, so it's got three, um, probably 18650 type batteries, or it may even be pouch cells in there, but they probably charge up to around 4, 4.2 volts, giving us that 12, 12.6 uh, 12 volts fully charged. And to get the higher voltages, the 16 and the 19 volts, 
selectable. There's probably some sort of a, a, a boost DC-DC converter inside. But I checked it with a voltmeter and it actually puts out those higher voltages. Uh, it says 600 watts, 600 amps peak. Um, if you do some little math, that ends up being a 35.7C capacity for these cells, which is a little bit scary. Um, but it says for the uh, starting current of 300 amps, which would be a, you know, a more reasonable 17 or 18C uh, just for a brief burst, which is okay. The charger goes at uh, one amp, one amp charger. So if this thing is, is dead in your trunk and you need it and you need to plug it in, it's, it's going to be a long time to charge a 16 amp hour pack. And so yeah, I mentioned the four outlets and the, oh, it's also got a little flashlight on it, which is kind of cool. Uh, you just, you hold the power button and the flashlight comes on. And if you push it again, it'll do a strobe. And if you push it one more time, you can hope that somebody knows how to read Morse code and they would identify that not only are you on the side of the road with your hood up, not going anywhere, but you are indeed in distress. SOS. So, say you are. And that, I think, takes care, about, takes care of that. I can't think of anything else. All right, stay with us. We continue to work on the um, Volkswagen uh, pickup truck, the Doppel cabin, or DOCA, as we call it. It's getting a Tesla Model S drive unit. If you recall, we bought a wrecked Tesla and parted it out and have gotten a lot of interesting things. A drive unit that's going to uh, uh, Nicholas uh, Pasali in uh, Pennsylvania for his uh, 63 Chevy Impala. Um, all the wiring harnesses are on the wall. Um, I've got the battery out there on a table. We're going to take a look at that. But uh, it had a really nice set of uh, black uh, wheels on it with low profile tires. I had ordered a set of rims uh, for the Volkswagen, but had to settle for kind of a small wheel and tire combination because that was limited by the Volkswagen hubs. Bill does not similarly feel limited, particularly with my money, so he uh, got some adapters and decided to try putting on the Tesla uh, wheels and low profile tires from the Rec Tesla on the Doka. I was surprised at two things. One, that we can actually steer the car, it would appear. And two, at how very good they looked on the vehicle. Let's take And so that's the Doka. We're looking at uh, three to four weeks for um, a machine shop to make us the uh, stub axles that go into the drive unit. We already have the axles and CV joints and, and wheels and wheel nuts and wheel bearings and the wheels on um, the vehicle to um, make all this work. But we need that last uh, eight or nine inches of um, shaft and, uh, and the disc that all that will bolt to coming out of the Tesla drive unit. And so we're waiting on that to get that going. So that's um, pretty much the, um, um, the show. Uh, we've continued to make uh, quite a bit of progress on our solar and our charging. We are going to develop a Chatamo uh, charge kit for um, you to in incorporate in your electric vehicle. I've got most of the pieces but have been unable to do any testing um, and software development. Um, because we haven't had a way to charge um, uh, Chatamo. And uh, we do now. And we can um, charge our charger um, using a battery. We don't have to have three phase power. Um, we can use a battery and we can restore that battery with solar power now. An additional 40 um, panels of uh, Panasonic solar panels. Um, another 13,600 watts of power and we can charge that battery and then we can, can use that to charge a car and so um, we have proved that so far with the Tesla I want to get a Nissan Leaf in here make sure it works with that but at that point um, we have kind of a, a test station that we can uh, develop um, a kit uh, for your car 
that you can install to do fast charging um, and with some uh, reasonable expectation that the software in it uh, will operate with any uh, uh, Chatamo charge station and actually uh, charge your car. So that's uh, where we're going in the future uh, along with uh, further development of the Tesla drive unit and eventually um, some work with uh, Tesla battery unit to make those somewhat more useful than they are right now. I had a guy call and try to sell me one of these batteries. He wanted $15,000 for it. I said, where do you get the $15,000 figure? And he said, well, that's what people are willing to pay. I said, well, I'm not willing to pay it. Um, I'm not too sure what anybody would do with it. He says, oh, they take them and they take them apart and then sell the individual modules to people. Well, what do they do with them? And uh, it's all kind of a, uh, a part and parcel that those uh, 18650 cells um, really need that battery management system engineered for them in order to be safe to use them. And no one has really um, worked that out yet. It shouldn't be that hard. Um, I've just got a target rich environment here right now. Um, but we'll get to it and get her done. Um, and develop the connectors and harness where you can just plug in a Tesla battery pack and use it um, as it sits um, without a lot of disassembly. Um, and that's uh, what I want to do, but I want to be able to read the voltages and temperatures and, and make sure that everything is uh, operating as it was designed uh, to operate um, when using it for um, solar power storage uh, primarily. We could put it in a car, I'm not too sure where. The Doka would actually carry one in the back on in the bed, I suppose, but it wouldn't be a very elegant uh, thing. It would give us a lot of range, but um, not a terribly elegant solution. So I didn't buy the battery pack from the guy and, and we have to continue to develop that. but. Uh, that's where we're going around here, and I did want to do a little uh, update and kind of work in our solar work with this amazing um, announcement, I think, uh, by Elon Musk. And you can see sort of com by comparison, this is the current way you do this is how we've done it. But a better way would be um, not so much for this roof, but for a residential roof these solar roof, roof tiles and the more elegant and more compact power wall and at $5,500 I find that a value with 14 kilowatts of batteries uh, 7 kilowatt inverter and the ability to interact with solar I think that's a fantastic value I've ordered too should be here in January you want to come and talk to me about my installation I'm not sure what to tell them, but I think I'll tell them to send me the power walls and we'll work it out here. For now, I'm Jack Griffin.